so I came to Whittier College, like she mentioned, because I actually got a scholarship here. Otherwise, I'm certain I'd be another member of my family that is a member of the Wolf Pack, and, and that's no kid, that's no lie. Um, and I was always interested in biochemistry. I think, again, it has to get traced back to Ron Pardini was my chemistry per, uh, partner in high school, which might explain why I ended up here at Whittier, because he came a year ahead of me, and they, you know, his father knew that I was interested in biochemistry, so he vouched for the program here, and the quality is, of the, um, quality of the school as well as the quality of the teaching faculty here and the kind of classes they taught um, and wanting a small um, classroom experience because if I'm going to be ignored in a classroom of 300, I'll stay at home and have my mom do my laundry. I wanted to come to this place where, you know, I get to know the faculty. Um, so long about, I think I always knew that I wasn't going to go the physician's track which was unusual for my class. I think I was probably the only one that was like, no, I don't want to be a doctor, um, which was fine. But long about my junior junior year, I kind of realized that I wanted to go on to graduate work. I really liked the idea of uh, doing research. And um, actually, it was at that time that Ron's dad came down and did a talk on um, natural products. Um, so he uh, takes the creosote bush, and they extract a pro uh, compound out of it called an NDGA and they used to use that to um, to treat tumors so he did this entire presentation on how natural products can be used to treat cancer and how they study how it causes damage to the cell the mechanism of action and that really appealed to me because it was an applied use of science and that was actually the reason why I went was thinking about chemistry if you think about it there's nothing that enters into your body that doesn't go through a biochemist at some point in time. Um, so I was getting a very good education here at Whittier College. Um, really great fundamentals in all the classes I took. Um, and at the same time I was also learning really good writing skills, um, very good communication skills, and learning also how to connect different topics throughout the curriculum, very interdisciplinary. And I think that that probably appealed to me in terms of graduate school as well because there are a lot of collaborations between different fields. So um, Dr. Pardini did recruit me into his lab because he happened to hope have um, an opening the, in a fellowship opening the year that I graduated. So I went right directly from Whittier College into the PhD program at University of Nevada. I was one of five students in the biochem uh, class that year. And while I was there, I uh, studied a light-activated drug from uh, St. John's Wort. Um, some of you guys know this as an um, antidepressant. Well, the, one of the bioactive compounds in St. John, John's Wort is called hypericin. It is extraordinarily lethal as a photodynamically active drug. In fact, um, sheep that graze on it, if they're light-colored skin, they come up with these what, these. Uh, blisters. It's called hypericism. Um, and you can't plant it anymore in New Zealand or Australia because it was decimating the uh, sheep herding, the herding industry. In fact, they imported a bug that chewed it all up. I was just in love with, you know, this cool little compound that could be used to treat cancer. And so I studied how it, um, how it caused toxicity. So about this time, actually, the molecular biology revolution happened. But I started a biochem, biochem program without a molecular biology class, and by the time I finished, you needed molecular biology to get a job. So I used my networking skills, and you go to a lot of meetings and such, found a position at the University, University of Southern California, and um, went right into Debbie Johnson's lab, and she studies um, a part of transcription called the odd Pauls, Paul I and Paul III transcription and became an expert in that. And since I've been there, um, we've discovered some very fundamental things that needed to be known about cancer that they didn't know before. Um, one of the cancers is, uh, one of the hallmarks of cancers is an increase in what's called polymerase three transcription. This is the part of gene expression that makes the tRNAs. And without the tRNAs, you can't make protein. And what we always knew is that in cancer, um, that this part of transcription was always upregulated, but since it's so abundant, everybody was like, oh, it's just a housekeeping gene. 
Well, Debbie discovered that one of the key proteins that run all transcription in general could be regulated by oncogenes. So we had this idea, well, maybe if you can regulate this particular protein with an oncogene, overexpressing it alone can cause cancer. And not only that, this is what drives this increase in this type of gene expression. So that is how um, I got my prescription. I demonstrated that it was necessary to uh, drive transformation, and that's how we got to write a paper in a scientific perspective in science, and that was the paper that was honored by uh, the AACR. Our um, paper was cited for outstanding contribution, and it just turns out that I just like being with Debbie so much. I did a fellowship to take a look into um, becoming a professor, but I kind of realized I didn't really want to write R01s and that, but I've been really, really good at helping my boss get lots of money for our lab. And um, so my current position, um, basically I'm self-supporting. My relationship with USC stops at the door of my lab. Um, so there's some benefits to that. As long as we bring money in, we'll always be employed. Um, we aren't necessarily subject to some of the cuts that we have sometimes and some of the political side of it, but the other side of it is, is that I do have to bring in the money, write the papers and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's where I am right now um, in terms of my career. Okay. So I can definitely speak to you about the graduate experience. I can definitely speak to you about how, um, how great it is to be a researcher at an academic institution and some of the disadvantages as well. Um, why maybe perhaps a Nobel laureate doesn't necessarily, shouldn't be teaching. Uh, for every dollar I bring in, a 50 cents more goes to the university. And I'll keep in mind that 35% of that goes over to the park campus, not even my campus. Right? Is it 35% now? Yes. Yes, it is. It's a very so, small subject. So the very fat, yes, we wish more of it was over with our, our but the thing is, is that um, what I do supports USC and its <clears throat> educational mission in that for every dollar I bring in, yeah, I get to spend that on my salary and buying test tubes and media and all that kind of thing, but 50 cents of it goes to the university and 35% of that is going to undergraduate education supporting um, the professors and the teachers and the students and keeping their, hopefully their tuition down lower for what it is, but you know, as you guys all know, undergraduate education is expensive uh, prospect, so, but that's how, that's how I fit into the academic um, institution um, and how basic research supports the academic institution. Yeah. So one of the things I do is also I work with uh, Association of Women in Science. Um, so as being in an academic institution, you kind of need to reach out. And so I'm very familiar with um, lots of people. I network with a lot of people that are in, at Amgen. In other areas, we do a lot of uh, programming uh, for career development, careers, um, alternate careers from the bench, that kind of thing. So I can certainly speak to um, different avenues and things that you can do with a PhD or even an under a BA in different areas. There are a lot of great jobs out there that you would not normally think of um, out there and we're always interested in uh, anything to do with the STEM, uh, science, technology, in engineering, and math. Um, we're very interested in parity for uh, pay and, and that kind of thing. So, And we welcome men as well, <laughs> all the time. In fact, I served on a national committee with a man more a west than I am. <laughs> well, if you have questions at the end, we can... Oh, I right over there. I was wondering, um, after experiencing a research, a research university after a one-year college, mm -hmm. what do you think the pros and cons for a liberal education are? Oh, I can definitely speak to that. Um, because one of the things I do, when you work in an academic institution like I do, um, you, didn't, you don't learn it on your own. You don't just come in and there's somebody there that's going to teach you how to pipe that or anything like that. You have to go out there and if there's something that you want to learn how to do, you have to go to another lab and say, hey, can you teach me that? And so I always tell somebody when I finish teaching, it's like, great, now if you're going to stay in academia, you have to teach someone else because you're here to teach. You know, you got to spread the, spread the um, love. So I have had students come to me from some of our public universities in the university system from California, and I've had people come from liberal arts programs, and I gotta tell you, even for myself, you guys have everything that, you learn everything you need to know here 
that you need to know going into that environment. What you most need to convince them is that you're ready to take on research because it takes an inordinate amount of hours to train a researcher. And so it's really hard for me when it's like, oh, well, I wasn't serious anyway, kind of thing. Or if they're just resume padding, because to me there's enough people out there that are really serious about promoting the science and going on that I've gotten a little bit more selfish with my time. I think where you benefit better um, than some of, the, of your competitors at other state colleges and universities here is um, they take a lot of Scantron tests and it shows. It really, really shows. Um, I kind of feel like, where's the problem solving? Where's the communication? Um, you know, you guys have really been thought to think critically. And you don't get away with just writing, with just filling in a bubble. You're, you have a fair amount of questions and a fair amount of writing in your curriculum that you have to actually spell out what you think. And so I don't care if you're going to like one of the top universities in the Bay Area. Um, or if you came from Whittier College, because to me, I don't think their degree counts any more than yours does. I mean, there's, there are people that are in love with it. They really are. And don't, don't let that dazzle, dazzle you too much. Go in there and know that you have, if you've, um, the fact that you can communicate and the fact that you can write well will put you ahead every single time in the fact that you can lay out a thought logically, well written, is going to make you stand out. And in fact, um, unlike when I entered in graduate school where you went into a specific program, a lot of these programs are now called um, our umbrella programs where you come in and uh, you have all the departments competing for you as a student. So it gives you the opportunity to check out the neuroscience guy over here versus the GI guy over there kind of thing. Ours at University of Southern California is called PIBS. Um, and the person who set up PIBS, enough Whittier College people were coming through um, the interview process that she's like, yeah, Whittier College, they've got some good applicants. And that person does not hand out compliments very easily. I know because I worked for her for 15 years. She's a hard nut to crack. And she understands the liberal arts experience. She came from it. Um, but understand that only thing I was lacking that perhaps my peers did have that I didn't have going into graduate school is I hadn't picked up a pipette before. So my hard sell going into graduate work was to say, how do you know you want to do research if you haven't done that? Fortunately, now you guys do have those opportunities. Um, and I think that you should use those to get internships because there are some great internships at Beckman. At, um, God, I think Pennzoil still has one, right? Not recently. Uh, or Babylon. Babylon. Babylon has one. Um, Angen has one. Genetech has one. Especially if you're a minority student, we're loving, we're loving to see you guys. Be looking for those opportunities. If you come into that with like having done a semester project or presented at the Caltech uh, forum for undergraduates at some point in time, you're going to convince somebody that, that you're reasonably serious enough about research that you're going to be worth the time to tra train. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. But I would say that don't just study. Get, get, don't just isolate yourself in the Stauffer building. <laughs> but seriously, get out there and get some leadership experience, join some of the clubs on campus because the other side of it is the soft skills, showing that you're not going to upset a team when you get in there because a lot of people are looking for fit. They really are, and it's really important. Too many people go into science with, because they don't like to work with people well. I don't want to work with them. They're really <laughs> difficult to work with. It can upset a, a, a team. It really can. So, <clears throat> I came to Whittier College, actually, by way of my cousin, Samina Shah. Uh, so I'm originally from India. Oh, you guys need? Yeah. Okay. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, <laughs> and um, so when I was a high school student in India, uh, Samina told me about this wonderful college, Whittier College, and all the wonderful professors and all the cool stuff that she was learning. And, um, and I was totally hooked. 
so I knew that, that I had to apply, I had to pass my SATs and all that, and I had to come here. And uh, what was nice was that I was offered a scholarship. So I packed my bags, I came here, and um, so I enrolled in a 3-2 engineering program. At the same time, uh, Samina's um, younger sister, Yasmin, uh, who's actually now a doctor, was also attending Whittier College at the same time. So we both went, she, she and I both went to uh, college at the same time, and she was a, in the Palmer Society, and I pledged the William Penn Society. And so I have a funny, I have lots of stories. 3-2 <laughs> um, was very ideal for me because um, I knew I wanted to get into computer science, um, and at the time, this is, we're talking way back in 98, when it was Netscape. You know, that was the, the, the ultimate browser back in those days. And you, you know, you hit the button and you could, you could see the computer chugging away, right? Um, so, so anyways, um, 3 was ideal. I, I knew I wanted to do computer science and, uh, and we had a great program at USC. So, I, um, I majored in mathematics and I had some wonderful teachers, Jeff Luchin, Abi Fatahi, um, Sharad Kenny, who unfortunately passed away last year, um, among others. And they really built my foundation, right? My foundation was built here. Um, so then when I entered USC, I was confident that I could compete and do well there. So the one thing I'll advise you guys is, you know, you're, you're all here and you're all going to succeed. I have no doubts about that. Okay, the, the fact that you're here, okay. Um, what you gotta know is you have to teach yourself how to learn. That's the important thing you gotta take from your education here at Whittier College and wherever you'll go next. So Whittier built that foundation for me and I entered SC, I did my BS, my, my two years there, and did my computer science. At the, t at the time, I started working in Dr. Leonard Adelman's lab. Um, so Len, Len Edelman, a huge professor, he's this guy who made the RSA code that allows um, credit cards to be encrypted for whatever transaction we do on the internet. He's the guy who built that code in 1978 at MIT. And then later on, uh, a few years later, he also developed something called DNA computing. Um, you could use chemically synthesized DNA to solve mathematical problems. And he demonstrated that using molecular biotechniques. And so I was a cocky undergraduate. I went up to him and I said, I can break the RSA code. And he kind of smirked. And then he said, would you like to join my lab? I said, yes. And he said, he doesn't do coding anymore. He does this weird DNA computing thing. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So I started learning molecular biotechniques, pipetting, uh, working in the in biohood, learning polymer chain reaction, um, and atomic force microscopy. Um, but I was taking a lot of computer science and math courses at the same time. So it was a beautiful blend of biology, uh, computers, and mathematics. And around this time, I also <clears throat> went to Caltech uh, for a couple of summers and went to a really interesting school, um, summer school there called Computing Beyond Silicon. People are worried in the industry, uh, the, the chip industry, that um, the so-called doubling in, in chip um, power, the so-called Moore's, Moore's Law or Moore's Trend, can only continue to, to so much, right? You can only extrapolate it to, to, to a certain time. Um, and so, they've already started seeing quantum effects in these chips. So we have to go back to the drawing board and ask, what is it that we can do different? Can we think of a different substrate uh, which we can use that will help us to compute? So that was a very interesting school. And there I met a couple of brilliant professors from MIT who were talking about a new thing called quantum computing. Could you somehow utilize the laws of quantum mechanics and build computers out of that. Could the very information that we, the very bits that we deal with, be encoded in, for example, the spin of an electron or the polarization of a photon? 
And if and when we do that, what, what kind of new communication protocols come out of there? Um, would things like quantum teleportation be possible? Um, and so a whole branch of knowledge has developed in the last 15 years called now under the umbrella of quantum information science uh, and quantum computing. And I was lucky that USC around this time, which is like 2004, hired Dr. Todd Broom, their first faculty member in quantum computing. So USC wanted a big quantum presence. And I took Todd's quantum computing graduate class and he took me on as a research student. And um, so I worked up with him on really cool and interesting things. Uh, so for example, I worked on something called quantum information hiding. How could you, let's say you want to send some, some secret message over some communication channel, how, how could you obfuscate that, that message that only you and the intended receiver could read, right? So this is like sci-fi stuff 30, 40 years in the future, right? It's all theoretical, but it's all mathematically driven. Um, and so I, I, I graduated from SC in, in, in 2010, and, and I wanted to switch gears. Um, I, I had done the DNA nanotech stuff, published papers, I did the pure theory, math stuff, and then I really wanted to d dive into technology and, and do you know, cool technology stuff. Um, and an opportunity came along, and um, so I started working at Shopzilla Incorporated, which is in West LA. And um, I was hired as a data scientist. Um, so we were crawling a lot of websites, um, trying to see, trying to gather content from the website using, using different techniques. And one of them uh, that Linda mentioned is this thing called TFIDF, which basically says, given a, imagine a bucket full of documents, how do you pick out the most relevant document based on certain queries? And most recently, now, I'm working at ID Analytics um, in San Diego. Uh, there I'm a scientist, and uh, what the company does is uh, fraud detection. So if um, I go to a bank and apply for a credit card, how does a bank know that I'm not a fraudster? How do they find out? Or if you go to a Verizon store and you get a new account, how, how do they know that you're not defrauding them? Um, so, so we build models, statistical models, that are highly data driven, <coughs> that, that tells these, these big banks, these big wireless companies, whether to accept or reject uh, a certain application. And it works really well. And, this, and, and, and what's amazing is that it's not sci-fi, it is here, these predictive technologies. Right? They're all based on a class of algorithms, a class of, I guess, computer science subject called machine learning algorithms. And, and it, that sort of comes out of the research of robotics. Um, how can you mine data? Can you learn patterns in the data? Um, and companies do this, and they're extremely mm -hmm. successful. They make a buttload of money doing this. Um, so we recently got acquired by LifeLock which is based in, in Arizona. So, so, and we recently went IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. So we're doing well. Um, and in any case, I want to end with, as Paul is that um, any, of you is, any of you are interested in an internship, maybe in the summer, uh, come and talk to me. Um, yeah. If you have questions, please. <coughs> Sound like a chapter from Outliers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I was when I was here at Whittier College, I was in the college choir uh, for three years uh, with Stephen Gottfeld. Had lots of fun. Went to Hawaii, went to Portland. I saw all of the United States. Lived, lived with all kinds of various families. Um, it was so much fun. We, I mean, I was at the writing center. I took um, uh, uh, one of those uh, January interim classes um, where I was active in the theater and also in the art department. So we were, I was double cast in a play and the other side I was making costumes. Um, 
I squeezed every ounce from this college, mm -hmm. and I loved it, loved it. And I encourage you to do the same. Just explore as much as possible. And you know, you never know how it's going to come in handy later on in life. You know, sometimes when I'm just, you know, doing science, you know, uh, what happens is I may think about poetry. I might be writing a poem. And somehow that allows me to think out of the box. And that out of the box thinking sometimes informs my scientific mind, right? Sometimes to be fearless, uh, to maybe sometimes take risks in proving something or doing something. Um, so that comes straight out of my education at Whittier College. You just heard stories by very smart people who came to Whittier already smart. Uh, my story is a little bit different. In fact, it's a lot different. Um, the only reason I wound up at Whittier or in any college um, was that my father, who had immigrated from Sicily along with my grandfather and uh, grandmother and uncle, um, probably would not have had a chance to go to college at all, other than he was an exceptionally good football player. And he was recruited by Chief Newman, who you may read in some of the lore of, of, of Whittier College. He was mm -hmm. one of the Newman Field and, and those kinds of things. And um, Chief took a liking to my dad, and, and uh, so my father was able to go to school. And uh, um, I was not a good high school student. I will just put that out there. Uh, I think not good is probably kind. Uh, and I probably wasn't a candidate for very, for very many places. Uh, uh, but my father said, if I talk to enough people, I might be able to have them give you a chance. And <laughs> all I was interested in was that they had a baseball team. And so as long as I could play baseball, which is pretty much all I did in high school, I figured it was fine. Uh, when I got to Whittier, um, it, was, it, was, it was a very interesting experience for me, to say the least. And uh, I think probably the, <laughs> the story I remember the best is in those days, we. All the freshmen were in Founders Hall down there signing in, or in Mendenhall, uh, signing in. And uh, I remember standing in line, and uh, I was really not very sophisticated about what went on in college or anything else. It had just been, I didn't actually realize that in high school, the reason I didn't do well on any of the tests was that when they told you to take the books home and read the stuff, there were people that actually did this. Uh, <laughs> that was a foreign concept to me in the neighborhood that I came from. I went to a high school where there was 980 people in my graduating class. Uh, and uh, I was from the sort of the wrong side of uh, town, and we were sort of ostracized too. In fact, my parents were told he needs to be in the industrial arts program so he can learn a trade and won't be a burden on society, and that was pretty much a quote. Uh, <laughs> so the idea of going to college wasn't really, you know, one of the things that any of us really thought much about. Uh, so anyway, but I wound up here, um, uh, like I said, through the efforts of my father uh, and uh, my uncle, and uh, who both went here. Uh, and they had um, not only tremendous gratitude and tremendous respect, and, and, and really uh, thanked Whittier for, for their ability to, you know, to sort of become Americans, as it were. Uh, and uh, so I, I wound up here, and we were standing in line there, and uh, as I'm waiting there, the lady who was taking the information was, okay, you're so-and-so, and going through, and then she was asking me, what's your potential major? I wasn't sure what that meant. Uh, and, <laughs> I probably couldn't have told you the number of possibilities that there were there. Uh, and so the guy in front of me said, pre-med. I thought, I said, that sounds cool. <laughs> uh, so I got to the front of the line. She says, said, and, and what's your major going to be? Uh, I said, pre-med. She looked at my transcript and said, well, we got a lot of work to do here. <laughs> so I mean, I literally took uh, you know, the remedial English class, the remedial math class, uh, all of those things. I mean, people now enter, you guys already know. Uh, you know. Uh, calculus and uh, differential equations and all that kind of stuff you know I was I was still doing you know probably seventh grade uh, algebra um, but the reason I mention that uh, other than the fact it's true is that that was when I entered here uh, as a senior uh, I applied to 12 medical schools and I got accepted to 12 medical schools uh, and that's has nothing to do with me that's what your college mm -hmm. um, they literally made something out of nothing. Uh, and they took someone who really had really not much interest in all in study uh, and said, you know what, this can really be interesting. And I think it was the environment, um, the experience with the teachers and everything else. And I still played baseball. Um, that's pretty much what I wanted, what I wanted to do. And we had, a, we had a good time doing that. And uh, it's interesting you mentioned the societies because I didn't know much about that either. And it was 
since I was total jock and hung out with all the jocks and everything, it was assumed I was going to be an orthogonian. I don't know if that still holds. Um, but as I went down when it was a day and they said, you got to go sign up if you want to be in one of these societies. So I said, okay, I'll go down and you open an envelope or something and then you say you're going you're gonna to do one thing or another. Is this pretty much what they still do? They anyway. did it that way. I don't think it was that way for you though, right? Anyway, I went it's down. It's all online now. Oh, it's all, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. online in 1967, it yeah. would have been on the telephone line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Assuming that was working, you had to wind the thing and call yeah. the operator. So uh, I went down there, as I, as I, literally as I was walking down there, someone says, are you going to join one of these societies? I says, yeah, I think so. I said, and by then I decided I want to go to medical school. It was in the semester and I realized you had to do a lot of things. So I said, you need to join some things and you need to have activities on it. I said, well, this could be a thing I could do as an activity. So as I was walking down there, they said, uh, you know, uh, so what are you going to do? I was walking with somebody who was a uh, year ahead of me, and he was in biology class. I said, yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to be an orthogonian. I know a lot of those guys. And uh, he says, you don't, you're not going to go to medical school then? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you can't go to medical school if you're an orthogonian. Those guys don't go to medical school. He says, you got to be a pen. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, really? I said, yeah. I said, okay. God, impression was set easy So now. I went in there, so I went in and I signed it as a pen. Which turned out it's not true because I knew several orthogonians who wanted to go into medical school ahead of me and actually probably were, helped me get in because they had done, done so well in medical school. When I went on interviews, they were saying, oh yeah, you're from Whittier. We've got these guys. They're really good. So uh, that was sort of, and I was probably the only pen that married an Athenian, which at the time was unheard of because Athenians only went out with orthogonians, but I was sort of like an orthogonian draped in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pen uniform, as it were. Um, but that turned out to be very fortuitous too, because I wound up uh, 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 getting roommates who were were pens in, the, in my sophomore, junior, uh, and in my senior year. And uh, one of them is uh, a guy named Jeff Shepard, who is on your board of trustees. Mm -hmm. uh, after having been the uh, the editor of Law Review from Harvard and uh, working as a White House fellow for years, uh, and has obviously been exceptionally except, exceptionally uh, successful and a very, very bright guy. And probably my best one of your story about Jeff, and I can tell this about a trustee, I guess. Um, <laughs> it, it's Here. nothing to do, we lived together for a while, and, and uh, I always, uh, and this, this, this has to do with the sciences, because the uh, two of us, the four of us lived together, two of us wanted going to medical school. Jeff went to Harvard Law School, my other roommate went to Boltall Law School at Berkeley. Uh, and both, I think, probably top five rated law schools. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, the two pre-med students made fun of him saying, you guys take all these soft classes. These things are so easy. All you got to do is memorize the notes. If there's no thinking involved, there's no nothing. So I made him a bet. And he was saying how hard their classes were. I said, I'll tell you what, next semester, I've got, I've got to take some other elective classes. You pick the class. I'll take the most difficult class that you can find in your political science nonsense that you take. And you'll take whatever I can get you into in the sciences because we have things called prerequisites. You actually have to know something to take a class. So it's probably going to have to be a lower division class. So he said, oh, I'll do that. So we found an introduction to microbiology class that he took. And he put me in a class with Dr. Harvey, who was uh, you know, sort of a legend poli-sci teacher, great teacher, and I actually loved the class. Uh, it was very interesting. Political parties and pressure groups. He says, oh, yeah, that, that one will kill you and everything. <laughs> he lasted six weeks when he decided he really didn't want to finish that class. There was a lot of stuff you had to do and you actually had to know stuff. And I wound up getting the highest grade in the political parties and pressure. <laughs> Only because I wanted to, you know, it became a competition. So uh, when he was Harvard Law Review thing, I said, yeah, it doesn't take much because a dummy who just, uh, you know, <laughs> barely got into school can get those, can get those kind, of, kind of classes. Um, but I think... I think the thing that I remember the most is the amount of support I got from faculty members uh, who were brutally honest. Uh, I, and I remember particularly Dr. Sherwood, who was my the biochemistry professor, and she also taught quantitative analysis, and I was a chemistry major. Uh, and uh, she, one time, we were working in the chem lab, and she said, uh, and, and she was originally from England and then lived in South Africa. She was from a brilliant family. Her husband was a, was a physicist at Caltech and JPL. Her mother was the editor of Tetrahedron, which was a big time oh my God. <laughs> journal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So very international journal, uh, uh, chemistry journal. And brilliant, brilliant people. And, but she, she, she was brutally honest and, and what a great teacher. And, and she said, uh, one day we're working in the lab and she was looking at something I was doing and she said, you know, you're quite dim. 
uh, and that was their English thing, as opposed to being bright, you were dim, meaning not bright. Uh, she says, but you know, with some work, I think I could probably get you into medical school, because you really don't have to be that smart to do it. Uh, and she was entirely correct. Uh, and, but, you know, but throughout the whole thing, she was incredibly inspiring, and she was the kind of person that literally we would sit and lift up around the corner here, and she didn't live too far from where we could call as we were trying to work through our biochemistry seminar when we were fourth there. There were only four or five of us in the class. We sat around a table. Uh, I talked to medical students every day who I say, well, how was your biochemistry professor at Berkeley? Well, there was 1,150 of us in the class. I never really could see him from the, room I, the part of the room I was in. Uh, whereas we could literally call her on the phone and say, Dr. Sherwood, we're working on these problems and I don't get it. And she would say, okay, I'm going to put the girls to bed in about an hour. She said, as soon as I've got them to sleep, why don't you come up in about an hour and we'll work on it. And we would literally walk into her house, sit at the kitchen table, and go through the problems. Now, I don't know how many places you can do that. That was uh, my experience in 1990 here. And, and it's, it, it, it was phenomenal. I changed my whole attitude about learning. All of a sudden, it became fun. And I want to em emphasize... Uh, you know, something that was said earlier, and, and uh, I mean, I think Sandra hit on it, and I think it's extraordinarily important. You were going to be so much better prepared than you ever thought you would be. Mm -hmm. And I told, you know, the medical student group earlier tonight, we sat there the first day of medical school and went around the room, and, you know, it was just, you know, what's your name and where are you from? And it was, you know, it was SEU, CLA, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, boom, boom, boom. And I'm sitting back there with well, my roommate who went to Oxy on a track scholarship, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were sitting there saying, should we just say we didn't go to school? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were like, they're going to say, excuse me, where is yeah. that a junior college or something like yeah. that? But uh, we didn't have any trouble yeah. handling any of them. Uh, and I think the thing Sandra said is very important, and it's this, this, this ability that you get when you leave here to critically look at problems and to be able to put them into words. And people that have presented papers will tell you mm -hmm. uh, in scientific meetings, and that is bad data presented well goes over a lot better than outstanding data presented poorly. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if you can't, you can have an okay idea, and if you write that grant well, you've got a better chance of getting funded than if you've got a brilliant idea that you can't put into words so anybody can understand it. Maybe at the 25th percentile funding. At the 25th these percentile funding. These days yeah. you have to have both. <laughs> yeah, Exa exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, but the point is, you need more than just being able mm -hmm. to fill in scantrons. I mean, I think that was well put. Yeah. Uh, and I think you will find yourself much, much more competitive than you ever thought you would be. So uh, after I went to medical school, then briefly I went, uh, as I said, to uh, into pediatrics because I had zero desire to grow up. Uh, and, you know, you have to get old, but you don't have to get mature. So uh, I figured that that would be the best place for me. Uh, and uh, went to Stanford in, in the developmental biology group up there with the idea of, uh, of doing gastrointestinal liver disease, which was pretty much unheard of originally with defects involving the, the urea cycle. Uh, and then into a congenital problem of the liver called biliary atresia, where there's obstruction of the, uh, the bile ducts that go from the liver to the gastrointestinal tract. And at the time, I started taking care of these kids as a resident, it was 100% fatal disease. And we worked on, uh, along with a group from Japan, uh, and our surgeons, our pediatric surgeons, a new way of attacking this from a surgical standpoint that at the time was thought to be relatively crazy uh, because it broke some surgical principles, uh, the way it was done. And um, turns out that uh, at least for a significant group of these kids, it was very successful. And for the other group, it's been a bridge to transplant so that we can at least keep them alive for a period of time when they become better transplant candidates than having to transplant them as, as little babies, although we can do that now. Um, we do that fairly frequently. Um, but I have kids that I can remember vividly the conversations uh, that I had with their parents saying, your child has a 100% fatal disease. Um, we have an experimental operation that we're willing to try, but we have no guarantee that it's going to do anything. Um, this is all we have to offer, we'll try. And uh, those kids now are not kids, they're in their 30s. Um, they have their own kids. They send me pictures of them pregnant. I've got one that I show on slides where she says, she sent me a picture of her like this and said, don't worry, Dr. Sinatra, it's not a liver problem. I'm going to have a baby. Um, I have another young man who, um, if the angels have any injuries this year, he'll probably get called up to the big leagues. Um, and 
and uh, this is a kid with a, with a, a previously, like I said, 100% fatal liver disease. Okay. Uh, and I now take care of their kids. Uh, and some of the kids, when I see the first grandkid of a patient I've taken care of, I think it's probably time for me to hang them up because that would be <laughs> extremely painful. It's bad enough seeing the kids. But um, a lot of the types of research that we do on the clinical side is what we call clinical or translational research, where we try to take stuff that we've fooled around with in the laboratory or we've worked with with our basic science colleagues and then try to translate that into something that we can use uh, in, a, uh, in a clinical sense to, uh, to translate to patients. And that usually involves what we call clinical trials, uh, where uh, whether it's an experimental operation, whether it's an experimental drug, uh, or whether it's some other experimental form of therapy. Uh, and it's a long process. It's not something that can be done quickly, but it, uh, it sort of marries uh, science and, and clinical medicine and uh, is, is something that's, that's very exciting over the long period of time when you, when you can see things over a, or over a period of, uh, of years. So uh, like I said, I'm extraordinarily grateful uh, to what took place here. I would not have participated in any of the kinds of things that I would have, that I wound up doing uh, had I gone to a big university or I would have been lost just like I was in high school. Uh, you know, in high school that had 3,000 students, I mean, I would imagine a college with, you know, with 20,000 students. I would have probably floundered around if I'd even got in and then, and then been summarily dismissed after my uh, pathetic first semester. But I think the environment here um, was so supportive. There was so much mentorship. And we've talked about it before. If I could give advice, and you've heard it already, if I could give advice to somebody who's going into the sciences, especially if they're going to be working on, uh, on developing their own uh, research career, most important thing you can do is get a good mentor. If you get in a good lab with a good mentor uh, and you work hard, you're going to do well. Um, but I've seen people who are very bright and willing to work hard who don't have the right mentor and don't get the support, don't get the mentorship, and don't get the kind of, uh, of support they need to, uh, to advance their own careers. You have to have people that are not only good scientists, but are also willing to mentor and, and support. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of the things we're trying to develop now. One of the reasons I agreed to take a job that I would have thought I would never take in my life, and that is working in the dean's office and, <laughs> uh, and faculty development. And a lot of it came from my complaining that we don't do enough to help junior faculty, um, that we sort of let them flounder for themselves. And I think they asked me to do this mostly so I could tell people don't do what I did. Uh, there's a lot better ways to a lot better ways to do it. So again, I think you were all very, very lucky, however you wound up here, to have wound up here. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, if you, don't, if you don't feel it now, you'll certainly feel it in the future. And again, just emphasize what's already been said, take advantage of all the opportunities, because there's lots of them. And, uh, you know, when you see what people have done uh, who have left here, uh, you know, of course you remember all of them passed out after a football game and you try to say, that one's a CEO of a bank, really? You know? <laughs> He's on the White House staff? you got to be kidding me. <laughs> but that's what happens over time. Notice a common theme there. I mean, it's like, all right, you already, maybe you've just already come out of that rat race that got you here to Whittier College. Well, look at what, what so where some of our people went. White House, Harvard, Bolt Hall, USC, over and over again. All these great places. Don't sell this education short. Don't let anybody else, anybody who does make you feel like it's not good enough, doesn't know what's going on here. People who know what's going on here appreciate it. And it's really funny because we make a joke, I made a joke about the Trojan Mafia. I ran into so many poets. It is hilarious. It is so funny. It's like, it, it, I don't know, you'll like get a poet radar and you'll, you'll be like in the middle of nowhere and you'll be like, you went to Whittier College? I went to Whittier College. It's it's funny. It's funny. It's like I'm. A, I'm like working in Dr. Louis Debose's lab. He's a pathologist, great collaborator. And I am sitting there using this piece of equipment. We're taking a laser and basically picking up little teeny tiny pieces of colon tumor or little teeny pi, tiny pieces of liver, um, normal liver, so that we can compare expression between normal and can, uh, cancerous tissue. And so I'm using a laser to sit there and pick this all up. And um, I happened to be talking about going back to homecoming. I think it was like my second year back here and everything. And this woman sitting down the bench, and she kind of like perks up and it's like, like, he was like, she goes, did you go to Whittier College? I go, yeah. I went to Whittier College. It's like, 
we've been working together for like a year. We never knew that we both went to Whittier College. <coughs> the guy that remodeled the lab that I had to set up, my boss moved from School of Pharmacy to School of Medicine. Turns out that he was, he was an O. <laughs> <laughs> He set up my lab. He helped. He was the project manager. He helped me pick out chairs and, and all kinds of things. He, it was really interesting. It's just like you'll run into poets all over the place. You really will. And several years ago, I was lectured to the second year medical <coughs> students, and uh, uh, one of the women in the second year medical school class was a great student, a really, really, really nice lady. She was sitting in the second row, and she had an accidental sweatshirt on. And I said, uh, you know, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, excuse me? But, you know, she was, you know, did I do something? Did I say something? I said, you know, I, I can't give a talk with somebody with one of them ugly oxy shirts on right now. And one of the girls in the back of the room went, go poets. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd, gone, she'd been to winter. I didn't, I didn't even know it. And I said, all right, you get the A. <laughs> you, I don't know. <laughs> Do you guys, have any questions? Oh, I just want to add, uh, do you guys, uh, uh, part of your uh, classes or you're taking, you guys for presentations? Uh, Embrace presentations. Yeah. Yeah. Embrace Absolutely. every opportunity to present. Really, really hone on that skill here. Yeah. How to present. Uh, what to put on those slides. How to weave a story. How to gauge your audience. That's That'll critical. come in very handy. Yep. Any science. Any science you do, because you know, just could, you could have the most brilliant cr cancer curing presentation in the world. If you are too afraid to get up there and talk about it, it's never going to get out there. But more important, here's the case where it's really, really plays in, and you might be able to speak to this as well. well you'll, you'll find a lot of, uh, if, especially if you go the graduate school route. Oh, I can't possibly show this to anybody. Well, you know, guess what? You're going to be suffering alone. I, I, from the beginning, I threw up, and this is partly because I got used to getting up in front of classes and stuff and participating in class and being vocal in class. Can you imagine that? All over and over again. From the beginning, from the first piece of data, the first dorky little graph. I mean, I put it up there at the bear camper convocation. You know, I was like, oh, I got my data and everything. But what it taught me is like, I started carrying on conversations with people. Oh, this is what this like, this is what you need to do. And that is what science is all about. It's an exchange of ideas, you know, so you don't wait till it's absolutely perfect to get into the science before you get it into science or nature or JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, anything like that, you are just like, here's my data, here's my data. And somebody goes, hey, you know, that looks like this. You should try this experiment. I got a buddy who's doing this. Let's give him a call. Here's a collaboration. They read your paper, you read their paper, they read your grant, you read their grant. You go to, you go to meetings. Lo and behold, you're talking to a Nobel laureate when she's just finishing up her postdoc. Elizabeth Blackburn. I went up and introduced myself to her because she was working on telomeres. That was like my first AACR meeting. I'm not kidding you. you know, it's like a few years later, it's like, all right, Elizabeth's got the, got the Nobel Prize. That kind of thing. But, you know, that's, that's, that's the community that's in science. That really is. And they're and, very happy and very anxious to, mm -hmm. to deal with, with, with students and young faculty. Uh, and uh, any amazing. chance you get, there's a science fair or there's a you know, whatever kind of, uh, of competition or anything like that, and you've got some work you want to present, put it together and present it. I make yeah. all of our postdoc fellows, when they're doing their work, as soon as they've got enough data that, it, that it's ready for some kind of presentation, before they write that paper, mm -hmm. they may have the paper three quarters written, but we take it to a national meeting and put the poster up or present it in an oral presentation, and then you get comments from all the movers and shakers mm -hmm. in the field, and you can fine tune mm -hmm. your work. And I won't deny it, there are jerks in our field, without a doubt. There are people who will sit there and just be devil's advocate or, you know, they'll make some statement. you got to ignore them. The people, actually, I kind of find that the people that you would think would throw around a lot of attitude are usually the nicest. I swear to God, if you guys called Louis, Louis Gnaro right now, he's um, the nitric oxide guy, guy um, at UCLA, he is more likely to go to speak to your class than he would be to anyone else. I'm not kidding you. They they like to hear from students. They really really do.
um, so take advantage of those opportunities and take the initiative. Initiative impresses the hell out of anyone mm -hmm. at all. In fact, that's generally how somebody gets into my lab. And I thank God because I went from a lab where everybody, the world comes in and does science with Dr. Bardini and thank God because otherwise I might not have gotten a chance. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you, <laughs> we got some doozies in there sometimes that were like, oh God, you know, it's like, they didn't want to be there. They didn't know why they were there. And it was okay. You know, that happens sometimes. At least now it's it's like with um, the current lab that I'm in, the PI really, really kind of screens and so everybody that comes in through the door really wants to be there and it's worth our time. But usually how she meets them is she, she some student goes up to them, goes up to her after a talk and introduces themselves and says, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm thinking. Of impresses her and says, hey, why don't you come in and talk to us? That's, that's how it's done. It's networking. I'd be more than happy to give you pointers or point you in directions of resources and that kind of thing. Do you have a student membership for that association? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Professional associations are very valuable to join, especially if you're a student, they're a lot less expensive. In fact, um, the AWIS chapter here is relatively young. Most of us are, most of the people in the group are postdocs and graduate students, but we are networking really well with the San Diego group. We're trying to mm -hmm. form a Southern California consortium. They're all very interested in just promoting the STEM, STEM in general. And I, there was a child development major in here. Right there. Um, I can tell you where there's a huge disconnect in our field and in the education field is that we have a lot of people in the education field that know a lot about how, what, what, how people learn. And there's a lot of people over here on the science side that knows that we need a lot better science classes. And I don't know why they can't work together. But, you know, being able to do both could really go a long way to solve this science side because I, I love the aquarium and I love the people down at the aquarium. In fact, they're probably going to be doing a symposium on how to talk science to lay people and everything. But dropping you out, your kids off to the zoo, not necessarily science. You got to get behind the, you know, the cages. And so a couple kind of thing. more pieces of advice I'll give you. And, you know, I hope you're not guys are not too overwhelmed by this. Um, you know, um, is, um, you know, a lot of people say passion is very important in life. You got to have passion for learning, passion for this, passion for that. I think, you know, what's more important than passion is discipline. Mm -hmm. Passion is fleeting. You will have moments of passion. You can't have passion 24 hours, seven days a week. But what you can inculcate is discipline, right? The discipline to open a book, the discipline to be critical of your own work, right? Um, those are important things right, in life. Um, so that's one piece of advice. And the second thing is, start building your network now, while you're in undergrad. You know? mm -hmm. And by that I mean, you have uh, friends on Facebook, you have Facebook today, you have LinkedIn, you, know, you have all these um, you know, websites that are used. <clears throat> Just be friends, you know, you can be friends with alums, you can be friends with whoever is uh, in your peer group. Because you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, when you're out there, maybe looking for a job, maybe moving to your next job, you can just drop a note and say, hey, how are you doing? You think you might have an opening at your place? And that helped me so much when I graduated from USC. You will not believe the number of interviews I got just by dropping a note to my friends, some of whom were at Google, some was at Yelp. Um, so, so, you know, Start building your network now. It also Don't helps, on it. It also helps with informational interviews when if you're not really quite sure what the job is or what you might want to do. You want to find out a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it is time for us to draw it to a conclusion. So thank you very much. We do always have a little uh, procedure here where I ask a question. won't be that tricky, but if you get it right, um, Caroline has a little for you. Yeah. Well, first of all, let's give our speakers a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you all. It's, it's always wonderful to sit in on these and listen to them because not only do you inspire them, but I always feel so inspired listening to my fellow poets. So, um, I didn't introduce myself earlier, but my name is Caroline Galvin. I'm class of 2008, and uh, 
I work in the Office of Alumni Relations. So these are the kind of things that we do. We have a great collaboration with uh, Linda's office, career planning and internships, and we just, this is a wonderful program to get you guys mixing with our alumni and learning about new things. So uh, at the end of these, we like to give you a little something so that, you know, we keep you coming back every time and, you know, get you, get you excited about uh, moving forward with, you know, maybe contacting some of these alumni. And, you know, if you ever need connections or if you ever want to talk further with some of these folks, talk to them afterwards and then also come talk to our office. We can get in touch with them and, and put you in contact. So uh, the first prize that we're actually going to give out is that we love to encourage you guys to RSVP for this event because there's going to be a lot of things that you're invited to and RSVPing is really important. So for those of you who did, uh, Jessica N. You're our first winner. Thank you very much. So now we usually have you RSVP to B2B at Whittier.edu, but do you guys have them go through a different system now? I uh, know they some of them RSVP to Don, but oh, okay, okay. But usually it's Don. And then uh, our second prize is uh, Linda's going to ask you a question, something about one of the something that the panelists may have said, a theme that was brought up, <coughs> something along those lines. So whoever can answer okay. so first. <laughs> What he thought always uh, stimulates out of the box thinking is what? Out of the box scientific? Yes, Damaris. Yes. Yeah. So that's just a couple of notepads, and then you also have thank you cards in there. So uh, a written thank you card is rare these days. So, but I think it's definitely still appreciated. So, and it gives you you know a different look, sets you apart from other people. So uh, last but not least, we want to thank our panelists, and we just want to offer you all a little gift. Thank you. So also thank you. on there is an alumni pin, which um, you. you only get if you participate in things such as this. So it's very special that, uh, that you guys came back and were able and willing to speak to our students tonight. So. It's a pleasure. Thank I'm happy to inter continue entertaining questions about the process. Um, or we can do it. You can. Uh, what whatever I you guys want to do. The students are always there after you stand up. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. Stand up, uh, mix, mingle, continue to eat yeah. more snacks. Are there more desserts yeah. there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. eat everything that's left. <laughs> and enjoy. Thank you. Thank and I encourage you to get business cards from our guests as well. That's really a good networking technique.